Yo, what's up guys and welcome back to another week of Tokyo Ghoul Read. Last week we didn't have a chapter and I was feeling it. I was actually feeling pretty down that we didn't have a chapter and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of back into the whole swing of things in terms of Tokyo Ghoul and being hype every chapter and boy what a chapter to come back into. Uh, really very, very powerful, very emotional uh, just overall incredible. Now, I apologize. I read the, the chapter. I was out pretty much all all day yesterday and I didn't have time to do a live reaction or anything. So I just ended up reading the chapter. And because of that, I uh, was going to decide to do this analysis, short little review slash analysis instead um, of, of doing a live reaction. And I like doing these too. I really, I actually love doing these over the live reactions. So um, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, but um, this is what you're gonna do. You're just going to have to watch, I guess, for this week. I don't know, uh, but yeah, next week will be the you know the live reactions will continue or whatever. Um, but yeah, let's hop straight into the chapter, and it's gonna be kind of improv. I didn't really think too much about the chapter. I didn't reread it that many times, but I did get some some things out of it that I did want to discuss. So uh, first off, I wanted to talk about. Furuta. So, if you see in the beginning of the chapter, he's throwing up. If you didn't notice, like you can hear, you can see, you can hear, uh, you can see these sound effects of like someone belching, because uh, you can see like uh, belches here and there uh, in the um, in the dialogue boxes where Furuta is at, and then you can also see uh, other text um, in other text boxes. Uh, DV members saying uh, they're they're like comforting Nimura or just like kind of calming him down. Um, now at first I assumed that um, this was because of the this is because of like Nimura like kind of like mocking the ghouls that went down there and just like making poking fun at them or whatever. You know he's he's crazy. You know he gave Ito uh, her like what you could consider the father figure's uh, flesh to consume, you know, or otherwise she would die. And uh, sorry, to get, to get you a water. Um, but starting to think of it a bit more, I feel like maybe this might be a sign. Now, this is something I hadn't thought of, but it had been in the back of my mind, but I hadn't really thought of until now. Um, if it is true that, that Furuta is like a clone or some kind of like uh, bread type of gold, you know, like... like I don't know. I don't know how it functions, but if the V organization has some kind of way to just kind of breed ghouls without really having people mate, it's just more like a clone type of thing, type of deal. Um, then I would assume that these ghouls may not have the lifespan uh, as long as like a regular ghoul or maybe even a human. And so when I was considering that, it started to make me wonder: Is Furuta possibly? dying like is he sick and when i started thinking about that i started looking back now i don't have any pictures but you can kind of go back and check for yourself but if you always look at furuta furuta always has he always looks kind of like he looks weak in, in terms he looks very frail and weak in terms of just his whole physique uh but also just the way he looks like his expressions it always looks like he isn't fully i guess healthy you could say and I don't think it it has to do with him not eating as much or anything like that. But I think it has to do with maybe if he is some kind of like clone bread type of thing, uh, uh, then it could be a possibility that Furuta is actually dying. And and when you see him spaz out in this chapter, he looks completely gone. Like, and that's the weird thing too because when you when we first are introduced in Furuta and up to the point where like you know. Uh, right now in these later chapters he's always been very composed and very uh, organized he doesn't really show his weaknesses or any faults uh, for that matter um, but lately we've just seen him completely break and completely go berserk and, like the dialogue that we had with him the interaction that we had with him and Eto, um he was going crazy like it, you it was just a complete 180 this guy showed the insanity that, that we've seen from other ghouls like kaneki and Eto and you know, like yoshimura um, we saw that from him, and that was something that we hadn't seen from him before up until this point. Um, but when I started looking at those scenes uh, again, when I started rereading those scenes and, look at, and looking at them, it seemed like he was more like desperate to just kind of get his point across and, and get things done before maybe the inevitable would happen, which would be maybe his 
death because he's running out of time or something like that. Now, I'm probably looking too into this. He probably was just mocking the ghouls, but um, I just kind of really thinking about it, maybe looking too, too deep into it, but maybe it's a possibility that, that if that is true, like if we go with that, like, if I don't know if you guys have heard, but there's like that theory going around that like Furuta is some kind of clone or something like that, and there's he's not the only case. There's like other ghouls that are just kind of like bred to like come out and serve V. Um, if that is true, then uh, I'm assuming that these ghouls probably wouldn't have that much of a lifespan compared to the another ghoul just because of how they're bred um, or how they're created. Uh, but it would be interesting, interesting to see that because this might be a character we won't be seeing for long. And right now he's just trying to do everything he can to wrap everything up uh, as soon as possible but that was that was an interesting thing that i, I noticed and uh, like again i'm not really sure i'm just kind of speculating here uh, but it could be possible i mean you never know okay so moving on we're going to the dialogue with eto when she breaks out of the um you know the the, the jail and everything like that uh and goes full kakuja and everything she looks ginormous but obviously she's she's coming through and trying to defeat Furuta and you can see that obviously she's doing this also for the sake of revenge you know uh, getting revenge on what he did making her eat uh, Shiono and this really kind of set in stone that she did care about Shiono to a certain extent I mean that was in a, in a way it was her father figure it was, she didn't have Yoshimura I mean not Yoshimura uh, no that was his name Yoshimura um, you know her, the, the, the guy the, the Kuzin uh, in the story, she didn't. He wasn't really her father figure and everything. Even though he knew, she knew who he was and he knew who she was. Uh, you know, he wasn't there for her and she was never there with him. And so Shiona was really that father figure that she, you know, needed throughout her growing up, throughout her uh, getting to her adulthood and everything. And uh, for something like that to happen, she didn't even kill him when she con when he uh, confessed to her and everything. Uh, she, in a sense, kind of forgave him, but. It almost seemed like she pitied him or in, in some kind of manner. So um, I do think that this this is just an act of, of Ishida again showcasing that ghouls do have, uh, they do care about people. They, they're they not just mindless animals. They are people with a consciousness and emotions and they do care about others. And I think that's just another reason of of uh, Ishida showing showing us this through one of the most brutal characters, one of the most unforgiving characters that he has in this series, um, to to showcase to us that she does have people she loves and to in a, I guess in a certain extent and people she cares about as well, and she is willing to fight for them um, as well. And I, I like that he he did that. I like that that we did we did see that um, here. And I guess you know with this going on. I'm hoping that Toka and all of them get the chance to ex escape, but I, you know, they're still on high alert. They're super high alert right now since there's not just Furuta there, but other members of V that are surrounding him, probably like lower end ghouls, but still, it's not anything to just be like, okay, you know, happy ending, let's go. Uh, no, they still have to worry, and there's still possible signs of death flags, you know, and and uh, it's not something to just be like, okay, they're in the clear, you know, just keep in mind this is Tokyo Ghoul we're talking about this isn't some kind of shonen or some kind of something simple really where people can just get away scot-free and, and nothing will happen to them no this is this is Tokyo Ghoul this is like everybody is in danger so keep that in mind these guys are not safe uh, they're not they're not in clear waters yet so uh, just keep them in mind but uh, moving on with these guys uh, I wanted to talk about the Arima moment. So the uh, the fight that goes down is is pretty pretty wicked, pretty crazy. Uh, we have Kaneki going like full crazy Kakuja thing. Like it's it's looking very very nasty. Just how he's he's transforming and and his regenerative skills, regenerative I think regenerative is that a word? Re regeneration skills, whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. His healing abilities are insanely well. Maybe it's because of the fact that he's a half cool. I think they're really, really well. And also he has Rize's healing abilities, which are uh, absurdly uh, incredible as well. Uh, but he, from his like, even like having, having not consumed flesh probably in a, in a good while, uh, he's able to regenerate, like he's able to create some kind of legs and arms and, and, and something like that. And it's very interesting. Uh, how how amazingly he can regenerate how amazingly he can heal he's almost like you could say near immortal I'm not, I'm not saying he's immortal but like the way he's able to re re uh, re uh, uh, 
build himself his own body and biological structure is very interesting i hadn't seen that in another goal before I, I, okay like eto yeah she got cut in half and everything but i think that was the help of dr kano so we can't really assume that for sure but but then again i'm not i'm not entirely sure she probably does have that crazy regeneration as well um but you know his cockroach is very deformed very crazy very but also very unique and very interesting and what i really want to talk about more about in this fight was just arima himself so as you see in this fight Arima's going all out on Kaneki. He's slicing him to pieces and everything like that, but he doesn't kill him. He never actually does. And it made me start to wonder, what is Arima's goal? What can we assume is Arima's goal? Because obviously he's not trying to kill him. Because if he he could have killed him be he could have killed him in Tokyo Ghoul if he wanted to. And but he didn't. And right now, if you see like when uh Kaneki falls down right before when we get to the whole conversation with him and Hide in his mind, uh, you see that he lost all his limbs, but he's still, like, his torso and his head is fully intact. Like, he hasn't gotten hit in any other vital areas besides just his limbs being constantly cut off and probably having some, like, crazy wounds all over his body. But other than that, he hasn't been pierced in the heart or, I guess, anything else, you know, vital in his body. So, it it's obvious that Arima is keeping him alive for some reason. Now... I've come to two conclusions, two two possible two plausible conclusions from this, from what I can speculate here. Now, there might be some other reason as to why. I'm not really sure. It might some has something to do with B. I don't know, but I've come to two plausible solutions as to why is he, why he's doing this. One, I think that Arima is just trying to find an equal. He's trying to find someone he can finally go up against and really go all out and really finally find this opponent that he can't defeat and he has to use his full potential here. Uh, kind of like Saitama in One Punch Man. You know, like where they're just constantly looking for somebody that they can fight or something along those lines, but they just can't. And um, that's what I was thinking with, with Arima. But the other reason, the other possible reason why I think, and this is the reason why I'm leaning towards the most, is... He is shaping him up. Now, he is shaping him up to become the king, uh, kind of like how Eto has been doing this entire time. Now, uh, kind of going off, off off subject, but it's still on topic. I was watching this movie yesterday uh, that it was about this this guy who wanted to be a drummer. And uh, the, the, the teacher that he has, he's very abusive to him, very, very mean, very insultive and everything. But he did all of this despite being very aggressive and very rude to him. He did all this, just everything he did, very low ball, very douchebaggery, everything. He did everything so that he uh, could shape this guy into being one of the greatest drummers in the world, which is crazy. Like, you, it's not something that uh, people would want to go through to become one of the greats. But I guess in a sense, if you're willing to sacrifice everything, then you will do it. And uh, he goes through all of it and, um, and he ends up becoming really, really good. He ends up... Uh, mastering this skill but the uh, reason why I'm talking about all of this is because when I was thinking about this movie I was kind of thinking about it and in, in, in also connecting it with like or referencing it I guess to Tokyo Ghoul uh, where this whole entire time Eto has been shaping Kaneki into becoming the king and it hasn't been methods where Kaneki would have loved to do even if would have wanted to do even if he was uh, given the permission to do you know like the manipulation the lies everything all this, even the physical torture and everything, I don't think it's something that Kaneki would have wanted to go through, even if he would have given been given a decision to. Like, like if Eto would have said, "Hey, listen, I'm gonna put you through through, through Jason for a couple days so you can turn white hair, break down in character, come back as somebody else," you know, like even if he even if he was given this and he said, "Even though this is gonna happen, you're gonna end up becoming great," like he probably would have st still said no. And that's what I'm trying to allude to with all of this. Um, this entire time, Eto has been shaping him, despite all the low ball, very evil and sinister ways of shaping him. She's been doing this so that she could shape him into becoming the king. Now, I think that this might be the same case in Arima's uh, perspective, where he's abused him constantly, constantly, constantly during you know during the time skip, uh, during that time we have we didn't see where he was constantly abusing him. Uh, maybe he was just doing this to shape him up to becoming that opponent that he couldn't fight that he couldn't beat or maybe or maybe somebody who could defeat v maybe arima has a bad pass and maybe he's one of those people that just had a bad pass with v but instead of being able to run away like rize was uh the only option he had was 
to find somebody who could become the catalyst to defeating V and stopping V and stopping him himself because he's just become this monster, this lifeless monster. And that's what I was thinking. I'm like, maybe there is more to Anima in, in, in this whole whole deal of just making Kaneki this kind of character and breaking Kaneki all these amount of times, constantly and constantly. Maybe there is some something to do with him not just being able to fight somebody like an equal. Maybe it has to do with him wanting to wanting Kaneki to defeat the organization itself and and finally I guess maybe this is how he's going to feel redeemed uh or, or um I feel like he can uh make amends with all his sins and and make amends with with whatever else he's done cuz we don't really know much about any man that's where that's why I feel like I'm I'm just doing too many speculations but it's like like we saw in this fight where he Told him, take me seriously. I want you to fight me seriously. Anima tells this to Kaneki. It made me wonder, why does he want to fight him seriously? Is it really just for the fact that Anima hasn't really had anybody that he could one-on-one -on -one fight and feel in any kind of sense of threat? Like, is it really just that? Could it be that? Because I feel like that's too simple in terms of Kaneki. Anima. Like, he is a simple character from what we've seen so far, but we don't know anything about his backstory it could be very complex it could be very personal and very deep and very dark and so taking all that into consideration and not knowing what anima has gone through but what he possibly might have gone through especially considering the fact that he was pretty much raised in v um i'm i'm, I'm assuming here i'm speculating here that there's more to it than kaneki there's more to him shaping kaneki this this way and breaking kaneki constantly uh than just him wanting to fight somebody as an equal uh, and that's what I'm that's what I'm assuming and that's why I'm leaning towards this more than just him saying oh I want to fight somebody like an equal I feel like there's more to it and this is him shaping uh, Kaneki to become this 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 person who could take down everyone that he wants to take down like the V organization or something like that I don't know but that's what I'm just speculating here really just all speculation I don't I, when we get more of his backstory which is probably going to be pretty deep um, then we'll come to really put the pieces together and, and understand more um, as time goes on but yeah moving on from that I, I feel like I rambled on too much um, hopefully you guys kind of stuck with me there uh, but moving on from from that uh, let's go to the Kaneki thing to the Kaneki Hide situation the, the whole dialogue there so Kaneki's there lying on the ground and it seems like this is mentally a mental projection here of uh, him lying there in, in this kind of like, it looks like a lake, and this is what I'm assuming, in this like lake of blood, and he's just kind of looking down at the water, looking at himself, look, looking at his expression, but really now that I think about it, it's just like a literal sense, he might just be actually just a torso there, sitting in his own dark mind, feeling worthless, and feeling just like, you know, I need to just finish things up, I'm done here, and, and this is all I can do. And that's what you see him right there. He's like, I guess I'm done here. And then we get this mental projection of Hide. Now, the interesting thing about Hide here uh, in this dialogue, in this mentality thing that we get of, of I guess, continuous mentality we get of of, of Kaneki, uh, this is a Hide, a younger version of Hide. This is pretty much the Hide that we see, like, in the beginning of Tokyo Ghoul when he, when they're, when they meet Toka and Riz and all of them, um, this this is what the Hide reminds me of. Because remember, Hide, the last time we've seen, we've actually seen Hide, he has long hair. Uh, he does not have short hair. And this Hide, he does look like a bit like an older version of him, but it still looks like the same Hide that we saw in, um, in, in, in the beginning of Tokyo Ghoul. And I thought that was very interesting because the last time we saw uh, Kaneki have this mental breakdown, and he spoke to Hide during this mental breakdown, Hide actually had long hair, and he looked a lot older uh, like the last time we had seen him. So that's the one thing that that I I had totally kind of put back past my mind, but I I reaffirmed it. You know, I kind of reinstated it into my mind, and when I thought about it, I was just like, wow! It it made me re re realize how broken of a character mentally Kaneki is because Kaneki right now had this whole conversation with Hide, this very deep conversation in which at the end of the day he was convinced that he needed to live to live for some sort of purpose, but really it wasn't Hide that convinced him it was literally himself like he convinced himself and then when you think about that because listen right this whole mental breakdown thing that he was going through it wasn't like he went through to some other dimension and talked to Hide in this alternate plane no he was literally in his own mind talking to himself 
through another persona, through another person that he knows, and influencing influencing himself by using other people uh, in a certain way, you know, like, and it's very very interesting. Like when I when I started to think about that again, and I'm like, you know, he's basically talking to himself. He's just using other people how he knows other people how, what other people would say to them to tell himself to reaffirm himself or to reestablish something uh what he thinks of mentally um but at the end of the day he's technically just talking to himself um when I, mean, I thought about that i, I thought that was just, I just it just reaffirmed to me that Kanik is beyond broken and when i thought about that i'm like there's it really really kind of brought more for me uh, in terms of me believing that Kaneki will die because somebody this broken who just constantly has to read them re they have these mental breakdowns where they just kind of change their opinion and change what they think of themselves and what they think they want to do by using other people like he talks to smaller younger versions of them younger versions of himself like a younger white haired Kaneki and a younger black haired Kaneki he when he broke down to Jason he talked to Rize and Rize wasn't actually there he's talked to Hide multiple times he's talked to many people in his mind but technically technically speaking he's only speaking to himself and when I thought about that I was like whoa this guy's complete he's far out there he's completely far out there because you know, when you mentally talk to yourself, you don't really think about like, oh, I'm talking to my mother right now mentally. You know, it's not, it doesn't work like that. You're usually thinking to yourself by yourself in your own perspective, like what you need to do, what you want to get done, what it plans in the future, what you've done in the past. But in Kaneki's sense, he's talking to literal like other people, but literally these people are just kind of uh, like projections of pieces of himself. It's very, very, very weird and just kind of shows you how broken of a character he is. And um, really, that's that, that that made me think there's no way somebody like this could, could live through all of this, like, and mentally be stable enough to, I guess, have some kind of life uh, where they can live decently and, and live with in society as well, like having conversations with people and not always thinking in this very broken sense and having this mental uh, instability in yourself. Uh, it's something that I, I just can't fathom seeing somebody live after all of this and making it out with some sense of of uh, of sanity. And um, I hope I hope he lives. Don't get me wrong. I don't want him to die or anything. But it's just it was just another reason for me to think there's there's there can't be any way for him to live. It just seems too he just seems too gone now now at this point for him to be constantly having to because literally he told himself what a couple of chapters ago uh maybe like 10 chapters ago 20 chapters ago that he wanted to die and now he's telling himself to live well through through uh Hide, but it's technically himself like in, a, in he's not talking to Hide literally he's figuratively talking in this mental projection of Hide on what Hide would tell him but he's literally talking to himself like when you think about that it's like he's literally con convincing himself everything like no one's actually telling him these things. He's telling him the he's telling him himself these things through other people. What he would think they would tell him, which which he would definitely tell him something like that. But I'm not saying he wouldn't. But he's not there to actually tell him that. And that's where I'm like, wow, this is a character that's long gone. Like I just can't see him being stable enough to maintain himself in society and with everyone uh, at the end of this. I hope he does, but. I was just kind of just wanted to showcase to the, that to you guys that this guy's long gone and don't be surprised if he does die because of the fact that he's just he, he it just doesn't seem to be plausible for him to maintain himself and that's what I just wanted to to to, to showcase to that with you guys but anyways uh, kind of going on with this whole conversation here um, we're having, you know, they're, they're talking, he's talking with this, you know, mental, uh, projection of, of Hide and, and, and one thing I always like about Hide, cause it is true about his character, even though this is Kaneki's mental projection of him, this is true about, uh, Hide's character that we've seen since the beginning is he always manages to stay positive. Yes, he does, he does worry, like he does worry about Kaneki throughout Tokyo Ghoul till he finds him, but he always tries to maintain this positive strength and this positive, positive out, uh, outlook in terms of everything because even when he meets Kaneki at the end of Tokyo Ghoul 
uh, he's smiling and everything. Yeah, sure, he's sad. I'm not saying that he's not he's not sad or anything like that, um, or he's innocent or he's dumb or anything. No, he understands the gravity of the situation, but he knows that he. But he has always had this very um, mental strength in order for him to stay positive enough to get through things and and and, and find his friend without breaking down in front of him or, or without us really showcasing or us really seeing those moments of him breaking down because uh, i'm sure he had those moments but ishida never really showed him to never really showed him uh never really showed us those moments of hide breaking down he's we always seen him very strong-willed and and and, and kept his head up high uh, no matter what the situation and that's something that i always admired about Hide's character and that's why one thing i always liked about Hide's character is because you can see that um, that's what kind of kept uh, Kaneki going, and then it makes it a lot more powerful. Where Kaneki tells him, you know, I'm so lonely without you, and he he breaks down, and he he's completely broken. It, it, it this this scene right here, absolutely powerful, because they're having this this funny little dialogue conversation where he's like, you know, put some clothes on, you're naked, and everything like that, and. And and all this and everything and and he they and and, and he they uh, Kaneki is just kind of you know grin, uh, smirking and everything, but then he looks up at him and he tells him, he they I'm so lonely without you. I I need you here, uh, and it just shows you how despite everything that he's gone through, despite his mentality and the mental state that he's in, he just really wants to be kept. He wants to have some sort of peace, some sort of peace of mind in some way he just wants to be liberated from all of this he wants to be free from all of this pain and all this torture that he's been through physically and mentally and he knows that one of those those havens that he had that that oasis that he had in in all of this was Hide but uh he feels like he did lose Hide during that moment in Tokyo Ghoul now 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 I want to talk about this Hide it seems like it is confirmed that Hide is dead in this chapter it, it does seem like it, it was confirmed uh from what we got out of it uh, and everything but i personally believe i still do believe now i don't believe it as much anymore but i still want to consider the the, the possibility that he is still alive because here's the thing one this is a mental projection of hide okay this is any any he could say anything at this point. He could be the total opposite of what we know of him. And this is only because this is Kaneki's mental projection of Hide. He, he can do anything he want in his own mind. He could make Hide be abusive towards him if he wanted to, even though he would never do that to himself. But he could do anything. And in and, and this chapter, and, and the way he, he talks to himself, and the way he Hide talks to Kaneki... Uh, while he's going through this mental breakdown, he's like, you know, there. I wanted to actually live with you, stand with you, stand by you uh, throughout all of this, but I couldn't. You know, kind of like assuming, seemingly assuming that he's dead. Uh, but it doesn't mean he's dead. It's just a mental projection of what he believes he did to actually be dead. He hated to actually be dead and be in the afterlife or whatever. But like he did, like uh, Rize, for example. We assumed Rize was dead and he had this mental projection of, of Rize and, uh, uh, and everything when he had that mental breakdown in Tokyo Ghoul. But Rize wasn't dead and she's not dead right now. So uh, who's to say that it could be the same set for for um, for Hide, right? Like it could be possible that Hide is still alive. And just because of the fact that of all of the dialogue and the way it's presented, it seems like he's dead. I don't I don't want to dismiss the fact that it, there's a possibility that he's still alive. Um, just because we haven't seen him yet. And I feel like for such a big character, we weren't, like, there's no closure. It's still, like, a left up in the air. And why is it so ominous for him to still be assuming that he's dead? You know, for, for Ishida to still be kind of throwing those clues that he's dead. He could still be playing with us at this point. You know, we don't really know. Like, the end of, the, the disappearance of Hide at, at the end of Tokyo Ghoul reminds me of, disappear, of the disappearance of Rize at the Tokyo Ghoul, at the end of, at the beginning of Tokyo Ghoul, because he disappears in Tokyo Ghoul, we don't see him at all, ever in Tokyo Ghoul Re. As for you know, so far, the only times we've seen him is when Kaneki has mentally broken down, and he, and he gets this mental projection of Hide talking talking to him. In Tokyo Ghoul, in Tokyo Ghoul, when uh, Rize disappeared, we don't see her at all in the story. 
up up until the first time we do see her when he has his mental breakdown during the Koshla raid, uh, uh, the Algiri raid, I mean, and she presents herself as this, you know, he he makes her this mental projection of Rize uh, talking to him. And then we actually do see her at the end of Tokyo Ghoul, like close to the end of Tokyo Ghoul, uh, where she's actually still alive. So if we take this into consideration and kind of see the parallels here, because remember, this is this is like a parallel of Tokyo Ghoul in some in certain aspects. Uh, he is the possibility of still he uh, is still being alive is still there. Now I'm not saying he is alive, but I'm saying the possibility cannot be dismissed yet because we have not seen that yet. We haven't seen. Kind of can give a flashback of Hide being dead or a body or anything like that. We have not seen that. So at this moment in time, I cannot say that he is dead. Just because of the, the, the way that Hide was presented in this chapter. I cannot say that. But, yeah. Oh, also the little bunny thing. So the reason why I wanted to highlight that is... Um, the reason why I showed that panel was because... The little bunny thing had also been mentioned before. The, the bunny actually referenced um, uh, before in Tokyo Ghoul when Hide actually found Kaneki when he was wearing the eye patch a, a little later on when he became the half ghoul he told him you know like he he grabbed him and almost hugged him and everything and he's like you know don't you know Kaneki that rabbits die of, of loneliness you can't you don't you know they you know I'm always here for you and everything um basically telling him that but you know that's kind of referencing that from the from from the beginning of the story in Tokyo Ghoul uh, from the little bunny thing that we got in this chapter also Another thing that I remembered was uh, the conversation that Donato had with Amon in Tokyo Ghoul uh, at the, in, during that, that conversation. He told him that he's, he said that you should be chasing Alice instead of the white rabbit. Now, a rabbit is the same thing as a bunny. A bunny is like a younger rabbit or something like that. Uh, and so I don't think that the, I don't really think that there was any connections between the this dialogue and the little bunny. What he what he said during this mental breakdown in in this chapter, excuse me. Uh, in this chapter, but uh, I I I uh, I just wanted to point that out. Maybe there are some connections. If you guys can think of something, uh, just let me know in the comments down below. I also now that Eto broke out of the uh, out of the prison, I do think that we will be seeing Donato escaping out of this. I do think that we will be seeing out, out of this, and I do think I do think he is a big player. Now that I, now that I think about it, um, I'm actually thinking. Actually, I'm not gonna say it. I'm not, I'm not gonna say it. I'm just gonna leave it, leave it in mind until maybe we get some more evidence. But I do see him actually breaking out of of the of Koshla. Uh, I, I don't see him dying for sure, just because of how ominous his character is and uh, how many, how many few times we see him. But every time we've seen him, he's pretty vital to the story in and of itself. Um, so I do see him coming out of this alive and possibly escaping or something else. I don't really want to say what the other possibility is. But him escaping is a huge possibility. Um, but yeah, there's this this little dialogue box of, of Hide telling Kaneki, you know, saying that, you know, I wish, didn't you realize that, you know, back then I wish that I could have lived on without you, you know, and everything like that. But again, I don't want to dismiss the fact that Hide is possibly still alive because we don't really know. It hasn't been set in stone yet. It's still been up in the air. Still a lot of speculation. So keep that in mind, people. Keep that in mind. Um, and then the last panel live so we see kaneki actually turning back into wide haired again which is crazy he instantly turned it like in the like in the anime which is very interesting very interesting when i when i thought about it because when i saw this i was like whoa he instantly turned white haired right then and there because remember in tokyo ghoul when he turned white haired it was kind of like in the span of days probably like in the span of like hours or something like that that he turned white haired but in the anime he like instantly turn white hair now it's probably just like an animation type of thing but we see this in tokyo go read right now during this fight during this fight of anima where they haven't been fighting that long they haven't been fighting for like an hour or anything like that probably a couple minutes probably like five ten minutes maybe that's probably saying a lot but even still they haven't been fighting that long and because of this he already turned white hair. He went from black hair to white hair. Now, he did have white hair before. Remember, his, his hair was soaked in blood and everything like that. It was turning back to black, but he still had pieces of white hair in his in his, in his his head. Uh, but now he's instantly back to white hair, which is very interesting. Um, and it reminded me of the scene in the anime where his hair was black and it turned instantly white. Um, I just thought that was very interesting. But now, I guess he's 
living. I guess he's decided to live after what he basically told himself uh, that he doesn't want to die in style. He doesn't want to die anymore. He wants to live, uh, but but for a purpose. Now we don't really know what that purpose is. We don't know what that purpose is, and that's the interesting too. That, that's the interesting thing because it, it it we are concluded this chapter with. Kaneki being reborn yet again to this white-haired version, this this quote-unquote real Kaneki, which funny enough that when people uh, saw the black-haired Kaneki that we that we got a couple chapters ago, everybody's like, okay, this is the real Kaneki, and now the white-haired Kaneki is back. It's like, okay, is this the real Kaneki? Everyone's saying yes, no, blah blah blah, but this is the quote-unquote real Kaneki. I don't even know where we're gonna get it afterwards. Some green-haired Kaneki or anything? I don't know. Super Saiyan-haired Kaneki, but. Kaneki is turned white hair again, and this white hair does signify a certain change of personality, because now in this sense, he doesn't want to die, he wants to actually live, but for some purpose. Now, we don't really know what that purpose is, and I can't even think of any theory of what this purpose is, because I remember when I did my video of Tokyo Ghoul saying that we were going to see one more version of Kaneki, this final version of Kaneki that learns to accept himself for who he is and what he wants to do. This is the Kaneki that was going to be a lot, this is going to be the, the truest, the purest, the most innocent and form of Kaneki with us that that has gone through all of this but wants to live for the sake of living for the care the people that he loves like Hinami and Toka and Ayato and Banjo and all of these people he wanted to live for them but just the way that this chapter kind of ended up rolling out and how he ended up changing I just don't think that that's the motive I feel like there might be more to it than that maybe just maybe he's living for the sake of just all ghouls in general maybe he's he's living for the sake of the unity between ghouls and humans, I'm not really sure, but it doesn't really give you any solid confirmation as to what he wants to live for. It just says he wants to live, but as for what, we don't really know. Uh, another thing I do want to point out is uh, this this panel was actually kind of showcased in a painting that Ishida did a couple months back. I think it was like in the beginning of the year, um, but it also came with some kind of poem too i don't really remember the poem i don't really have it on me either but uh i just thought it was pretty interesting that he actually had foreshadowed this a, a while while back and it just also showcases to you how long he had been preparing the story now i do think that he has the story pre-planned out for the longest probably before maybe even tokyo ghoul was created he already had a draft of everything he wanted to connect the dots and everything because this definitely isn't a story you can't be making up every week unless you're like some Einstein level genius to be connecting dots and referencing things back and forth like this and making a story like this and composing it like this every week on a whim definitely it's not possible it's definitely not possible it's something that he had to have had years and probably maybe months or years of planning to do and, and formulate and, and, and put all together um, and I think this is just a, an example of that but even still major major props it's an incredible story so far absolutely loving it and I just can't wait to see what we get next chapter. Really, now that the world has a world has been destroyed, and the 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 um, the king that that lives in this egg, the egg has been broken out, and then now he is he is free to do whatever he wants, and he is free to to uh, to set out to 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 complete his goal and accomplish his goal. And now we aren't living, and now we aren't dying in style anymore. Now we are living, but living for what? What is that purpose? What is going to happen? We don't really know, but. We'll have to wait and see in next week's chapter. But again, that's our, those are my thoughts about this chapter. Sorry if it's not as detailed as you guys wanted it to be. Um, just really wanted to throw some thoughts out there on what I thought about the chapter and everything that I want to discuss. Uh, but but really, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below what you guys thought about this chapter and everything that you guys can speculate. Any clues, anything I missed, let me know all that in the comments down below. Uh, leave a like if you enjoyed the video, guys. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.